Hello, my name is Wade Goria. I'm an historian and uh, lecturer for the National Lighthouse Museum here in St. George, Staten Island. And uh, as you can see, we've, we've, we've made an establishing shot here to let you know where we are. So if you'll look out, you'll see this is the, uh, the Narrows, which separates Staten Island from uh, Brooklyn. Down to the uh, south, we have the Verrazano Narrows Bridge which is the um, entryway to New York Harbor. In order for you to understand the origins of the um, National Lighthouse Museum, it might be a good idea to start out with what the first uh, purpose was of this particular area. And it was a maritime hospital, um, a maritime hospital that uh, served as a quarantine station for people who were suffering from typhus or um, smallpox or yellow fever. And uh, it, this particular site was selected because it could take up to five hours for people to, uh, to make the journey from Manhattan over here to St. George. And the um, facility, what became known as, as the Maritime Hospital, uh, was um, completed in 1798. Now this was before steam uh, steamships were invented and um, the as I said the journey could be a very long one. So um, the population was quite sparse here and it seemed to be a good location for a maritime hospital. Uh, not that many people would be affected uh, in the surrounding area by people who had these diseases. Uh, just behind me is a condominium where the main building of the Maritime Hospital was situated. Um, so this Maritime Hospital continued until 1858. Now there was a lot of problems with the Maritime Hospital. The people who lived in this area were not happy at all that it was here. And particularly in the 1840s, when there was an enormous number of um, Irish and German people coming from Europe, um, some of them bringing diseases with them, um, the area around here began to be infected by um, uh, outbreaks of disease, such as cholera. And uh, there was a, a, a call for this facility to be shut down. Uh, Albany... Uh, back then did much what it does today, uh, absolutely nothing about it. And uh, as a result, local people took the issue into their own hands. And over a two-day period on September 1st, 1858 through September 2nd, the entire complex was burned down. Uh, people were, um, uh, who were inhabiting this uh, facility were brought to safety so it, there, there wasn't a problem in that respect but the entire place was reduced to ashes. Um, after that took place uh, the people who performed the arson received a great deal of support from local politicians, from the judge, from Cornelius Vanderbilt who paid their legal expenses and the judge consistently uh, used his gavel to knock uh, not guilty to uh, each person who had been charged uh, with crime. Uh, so that was in 1858. Uh, now we have an area of, not, of 18 acres that is entirely burned down. And uh, if we go back to um, March the 3rd of 1851, this is a time when the Lighthouse Board is established. Now that's a, a reorganization of the Lighthouse establishment. The Lighthouse Board is going to uh, uh, professionalize the um, Lighthouse establishment to a much greater extent. There are going to be uh, people from, two representatives from the, uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, the Navy, uh, scientists, people who are very determined to update, to modernize, the uh, lighthouse uh, uh, establishment and um, also bring new um, advances into the lighthouse establishment uh, and that mainly concerned 
the adoption of new Fresnel lights that were being uh, built by France and Britain uh, that were dramatically improving the um, quality of the uh, and range of the lights that were in lighthouses. So one has to keep that development in mind, 1851, 1852, and then conveniently, I should say, in 1858, this complex is burned down. There is a desire on the part of um, Washington to find a new depot. In fact, there's a complete reorganization taking place. And to make a long story short, this becomes the third district of the U.S. Lighthouse Board. And it also, by 1860, is going to develop into what they call a super depot. Uh, it's going to have many more facilities than... Um, other depots in the United States and there's going to be uh, this will be the place where Fresnel lights are going to arrive from either London or or France uh, and be stored here and then sent to whatever uh, lighthouse uh, needed them. We're looking at the main courtyard of the um, uh, what was the General Depot it was sometimes called the Tompkins uh, Tompkinsville uh, depot or the um, uh, St. George Depot. And uh, this courtyard uh, was really a kind of a center of activity. The building, the very large building that you see, which was done in a um, Greco-Roman sort of classical style, was built in 1868, just about four years after the um, facility first began to open. And this was the original lamp shop. This is where Fresnel lights would have arrived. Um, in time, that facility uh, simply wasn't uh, uh, spacious enough to handle all the activity that was taking place. And so this building over here, which is uh, labeled lamp shop, uh, became the new lamp shop. Now, the museum that we're in uh, was a building that um, uh, was known as the um, uh, uh, machine shop or the foundry building. Uh, it was also known as building number 11. And uh, it's, it's done in a slightly different style. It's a, a Dutch, a neo-Dutch style. Uh, and so this particular building was used to um, um, fabricate uh, anchors, and buoys. Uh, some of these buoys are very tall, necessitating a uh, very high ceiling, which is uh, what we have here at the, um, uh, the headquarters of the National Lighthouse Museum. Now, over there, there's a pile of rocks, and that used to be uh, the site of what was a testing lighthouse. Um, and it was a lighthouse that stood there from 1883 until 1898. In 1898, an area off the coast of um, Sandy Hook called Romer Shoals was having a great deal of difficulty with their um, uh, various uh, uh, lighthouses and uh, uh, aids to navigation. And uh, what was needed was a really uh, uh, serious effort at building um, the foundation for uh, a lighthouse that was taken from this courtyard and moved over to Romer Shoals where it remains today. Uh, Romer Shoals Lighthouse was nearly destroyed by Tropical Storm Sandy in uh, 2012, but it, it remains on that site. Now, just in front of us, you see there's a building that's covered in kind of a white tarpaulin, and that was known as the Administration Building. Uh, that building is very important. In fact, the, it was the first building, well, the only building of all these buildings that is a national landmark. And the reason for that is because the architect, uh, Alfred B. Mullet, um, designed that building, and he designed it in a very different style from the other buildings, in a French Empire style with a mansard roof. Uh, Mullet is known for a great many other buildings in the United States. Um, the Portland Courthouse, uh, his most famous work is the old executive office building 
which was the original headquarters for the uh, State Department of War and Department of Navy building, uh, which is an extremely ornate building. A uh, long story about poor Alfred Mullet. His building was bitterly criticized. People like Henry Adams and Mark Twain uh, were relentless in their criticism of this garish style that came out of Paris. And uh, um, his, um, he had a lot of legal um, efforts to try to get the money that was owed him for these projects. He ended up committing suicide. Um, this building is going to be completely restored. Uh, it's, it's a real pride and joy of the depot area. And just to, uh, as, as you're looking at the building to the right, there's a long building that was known as the Barracks Building, and that was a, uh, originally used by the Revenue Cutter Service. Now, that was an original name for the U.S. Coast Guard. It was first the Revenue Marine, Revenue Cutter Service, uh, and in 1868, it moved to 28 Pine Street in Manhattan uh, to kind of make way for all of the activities that were needed in order to supply lighthouses with uh, all the aids to navigation that you see here, the buoys and, of course, the Fresnel lights. Uh, and um, this place was really hopping. By the, the turn of the century through the 20s, there were about 250 people employed here. And it was very, it was a, it was a good federal job. Um, and uh, there were people working here who had enormous skills, uh, kind of jacks of all trade, the sort of person you'd like to come and visit your house and fix everything that needed to be fixed. Um, in time, in, in 1939, the U.S. Coast Guard took over this facility. And um, the kind of specialized training of the Lighthouse Service um, dissipated somewhat. There was a lot of controversy about that. Uh, but from 1939 until 1966, this facility was uh, controlled by the U.S. Coast Guard. I myself remember my father taking me for walks around here and looking at the Coast Guard facility. And I remember my father telling me uh, he was a, a veteran of World War II, had been in the Battle of the Bulge, uh, got a Bronze Star, and he said, son, I don't recommend that you go into the military, but if you do, make it the Coast Guard. He said uh, you would find that extremely satisfying. But the Coast Guard moved out of here in 1966 over to Governor's Island. The area lay dilapidated for a very long time. And again, lots to talk about the role of, of uh, Mayor Ed Koch, the role of Mayor uh, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, I think Rudy Giuliani played a, a, a very important role in uh, creating an economic development corporation that was going to help preserve this building. Efforts to create the museum um, encountered some difficulties, especially after 9-11. But eventually, in uh, 2014, this building here, the... Um, Building number 11, the foundry building, uh, or the machine shop, uh, would open as the National Lighthouse Museum. And um, let's go inside and have a look at some of the collections that are in the museum. Now, um, on a hot day like this, uh, you'll be happy to know that the um, museum is very well air conditioned. And immediately on your right, as you walk in, you'll see a map of the world. In fact, we have a number of maps of the world here where people have placed pins uh, on the spot where they're from. And as you can see from these pins, we get people from all over the world. And this is a, a, a wonderful place to, to meet a very international crowd. I mean, one moment we could have people from Scandinavia, Argentina, um, you name it. And uh, so I always think that lighthouse people are particularly um, interesting uh, people and they managed to find this location. They're, they're always very happy to be here. Very often when people come into the museum, they're expecting to see a lighthouse. Well, as I mentioned before, we did have a lighthouse here. It was a testing lighthouse and it was moved over to Romer Shoals. So we actually don't have a lighthouse, uh, a bona fide lighthouse to show people uh, because this was a place um, that was dedicated to repairing lighthouses and providing aids to navigation. But what we do have here 
is a structure that's shaped like a lighthouse called the Hall of Lights. And we have a beautiful um, collection of um, lighthouses. Many of them were manufactured by a company called Harbor Lights, which did an astounding job at reproducing uh, in great detail um, uh, lights from throughout the world. There, were 10, there are 10,000 lighthouses in the world. And uh, Harbor Lights, which sadly went out of business, I believe 2007 or 2008, uh, you can get them now on eBay. As you continue to walk into the museum, you'll see a uh, boat here, a rowboat, which, is, which was discovered uh, off of Glen Cove. Apparently it had been embedded in sand for 100 years uh, and then kept in storage right near the Elm Tree Lighthouse uh, along the coast at Miller Field. And uh, it eventually made its way to the National Lighthouse Museum. Someone from the Coast Guard called us up, thought we'd be interested in it. And uh, there are numbers indicating that the um, uh, boat was built uh, after 1912, which is when the um, uh, Lighthouse Board became the U.S. Lighthouse Service. Our museum is very proud of many of the placards and uh, uh, informational boards that we've uh, uh, provided uh, museum goers. Um, one of them uh, concerns this timeline, which focuses on the developments of uh, lighthouses in the United States. Um, there's a shot of George Washington here, and for those of you not aware, both George Washington and Alexander Hamilton play a very, very important role in the development of what became the uh, U.S. Lighthouse Establishment uh, by sponsoring a congressional bill, the first infrastructural project in the United States uh, to federalize and build lighthouses from Maine down to Georgia. Um, George Washington himself micromanaged many, many uh, lighthouse um, activities and was actually in direct touch with lighthouse keepers. We have an exhibit here of some of the items that were made um, at the General Depot and uh, one of the things that uh, we like to emphasize to tourists who, who come to the museum is that absolutely everything in this museum was made from raw materials from scratch with the exception of the Fresnel lights which were produced in um, uh, France or England and were of course extremely delicate uh, objects that had to be uh, transported in the most careful way uh, uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. But we have everything from a dustpan to clocks to toilet paper rolls, um, all the tools, everything here was fashioned by the employees at the General Depot. Bob Isley is one of our great volunteers and one of the most knowledgeable people that you could ever meet about this, uh, about this museum. He's affectionately known as Patches. And the reason for that has to do with all of these amazing patches that Bob collected. Um, I understand there's over 2,000 of them. Um, and they're from all over the Western Hemisphere. Um, Every one of these patches is distinguished by a lighthouse. Now, it may be controlled by the fire department or the police department, but each one um, is representative. Here's Buffalo, New York, is representative of a lighthouse um, in the Western Hemisphere. And uh, it's an extraordinary collection and one that Bob amassed over many years. And uh, um, Certainly, very, there's a, a database that you can get more information about each one of these lighthouses and, uh, uh, and their locations, and it's a very interesting aspect of our collection. Now, what we're looking at here is a map of the New York metropolitan area showing um, lighthouses uh, in both New York City and the outlying areas. There are nine lighthouses in New York City. Um, and 27 in the New York metropolitan area. Staten Island is particularly uh, well fortified with uh, lighthouses. We don't have time here to go over all of them, but it's a very interesting uh, map and one that a lot of our visitors love 
to look at in some detail. It should be remembered that our Lighthouse Keepers Gala uh, honors these great lighthouse keepers who were the mainstay of the lighthouses. Uh, many of them worked their whole lives at lighthouses and were highly professional, highly skilled, and very dedicated people. And so we have a, um, an exhibit here showing some of the more famous, colorful uh, lighthouse keepers, uh, including Margaret Norvell, uh, Charles Vanderhoop Sr., uh, Kate Walker, who was the, uh, who was actually a legend in her own time, um, uh, a story was written about her while she was still a lighthouse keeper uh, in the New York Times, I believe, in 1918, um, and discussing her life. It's a very interesting story, and uh, we often like to discuss Kate Walker. Uh, the Robins Reef Lighthouse is located. Uh, quite close to the National Lighthouse Museum. And in fact, you can see it from several angles uh, from the pier, uh, Pier 1, that extends out into the Narrows. These various lights are uh, examples of what you'd find on a lighthouse ship. Uh, there was a time when lighthouse ships were very popular in the 19th century, and it was thought that they would be um, able to possibly um, remain at um, dangerous places while uh, ships could be warned uh, of um, impending storms or dangerous shoals. And so these are various lights, a 375 millimeter um, drum, uh, drum lens uh, that went on a lighthouse ship. Um, so that's what you're seeing here. Uh, we have uh, an oil lamp um, and we have um, a lantern that was used on uh, lighthouse ships. You can visit one such lighthouse ship if you go to the South Street Seaport and you can see the Ambrose Light, uh, uh, light Ship, which is no longer, obviously no longer in service. Uh, it was replaced by Texas Towers and other um, lights. In fact, there's a long, difficult history of these um, uh, fixed lights being crashed by ships. Uh, over the last 20 years. Um, but uh, in the era of the um, uh, lighthouse ship, we have some very important um, uh, examples of equipment used. If you'll remember um, when we were out in the courtyard, I mentioned that the building next door, the lamp shop, was the one place in the United States where Fresnel lights arrived and were checked to make sure that they had um, weathered uh, an Atlantic um, uh, voyage successfully and uh, were operational. And uh, Fresnel lights are named after Augustin Fresnel. Augustin Fresnel was a Frenchman who worked under Napoleon as a road builder, but he was obsessed with providing a more efficient light, which had been a tremendous complaint of many people, particularly in the Navy, uh, who found that lights were even though somewhat improved, very unsatisfactory. Fresnel revolutionized lighthouse technology and uh, his lights could be seen 25, 35, 45 miles away. And in fact, a variation of a Fresnel light uh, was placed on the Atlantic Highlands uh, uh, Navisync twin lights, uh, twin lighthouse. Uh, and the glow of that particular light could be seen 75 miles away. As I said, it was a change of unbelievable proportions for uh, trade and commerce uh, in the world. It opened up new sea lanes and it played a very, very important role in uh, globalizing um, the world economy. After you've had a chance to learn about how lighthouses uh, played a critical role in developing America's commerce and trade. After you've learned a lot about the technology uh, that's associated with lighthouses and seen many of the great exhibits that we have, uh, a visit to the gift store we think would be a great idea. Um, we, we really do have a very fine gift store uh, and it, there's a lot of really interesting items. My, one of my favorites is a, is a mug that has the original seal uh, of the lighthouse service, and uh, it's one that um, uh, I like having my coffee with that in the morning. But there are some beautiful 
uh, shirts and postcards and art, and we have people who regularly contribute um, original works of art that are on sale. And uh, if by any chance you're not able to get to the museum and are interested in some of these items, uh, we, we have a, a website and it's nationallighthousemuseum.org and you can order just about anything that uh, we have uh, online. But um, uh, I'd like to uh, just introduce you briefly to uh, Jim Sarlo. Jim, you want to come over here and just wave hello? And uh, Hi, this is everybody. Jim Sarlo, Welcome who's to the really museum. one of our great volunteers. Uh, Jim uh, does everything for us. And uh, he runs the gift shop. And uh, we're, we're so uh, grateful to Jim for all of his great work. And uh, he, um, uh, he's one of the friendliest, nicest people you'll, you'll ever meet. So not only will you enter a gift shop that has lots of great stuff, but you'll also get a chance to meet Jim. We at the National Lighthouse Museum are very proud of our museum and of our exhibits and of the great people who are associated with our museum. The very fine people who have contributed to the museum to make, it, to make it go and to become a very important part of the cultural life of uh, St. George, Staten Island. Um, I'd like to close here with uh, uh, a remark concerning lighthouses. A lot of people when they think of lighthouses, yes, they're their aids to navigation, they're very important to help uh, uh, save lives. Um, with respect to the United States, lighthouses were absolutely critical to the foundation of this republic because without lighthouses, goods could not have safely entered into the ports and consequently be taxed so that we had a tax base. Um, in 1789, when the National Lighthouse Establishment was created, we were dead broke, very much in the red. Uh, five years later, as a result of the uh, lighthouse program and the beginnings of what was to become the Coast Guard Service, starting with the Revenue Marine, uh, the United States was very much in the black. And we can attribute that to lighthouses. So there's an inextricable link between lighthouses and the foundation of the American Republic. We're proud of that, we welcome you here, and we really hope that you'll make an effort to visit this uh, great attraction in Staten Island, New York.